Hello and welcome to video 20. Uh, this is the last Plato video and they were just covering a little snippet of the end of a dialogue called Phaedo. And actually mostly I want to focus on the exercise that I'm, we're doing in conjunction with Phaedo. So this is the deal. Phaedo is an extended argument for actually it's four arguments for the immortality of the soul, right? And this is an obvious, obviously important philosophical question that a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking about. And it's probably something that you've thought about when I, I open the class with a list of uh, questions that you might have asked yourself, philosophical questions. And, um, you know, immortality, uh, the existence of an afterlife is a really common one there. Um, I want to approach this from a slightly different angle, though, than the way that most, most people generally ask the, the question of an afterlife um, in American society. I want to ask, first of all, what exactly it is about us that survive, that might even survive into an afterlife. That is, what is a soul to begin with? Um, so, um, not every society, not every religion believes in souls or is fixated on an afterlife. So ancient Judaism and the ancient Israelites prior to basically the arrival of Greek culture because of the Romans, um, did not have a strong notion of the afterlife. If you look at the Hebrew Bible, there, um, there, are, there are no references to an afterlife that um, uh, are, uh, you, know, you can sort of read things into it after the fact, but there are no real references to souls or an afterlife, right? Um, and Greek society was like that for a very long time as well. Um, the idea that living creatures have an immortal soul is something that you have to be convinced, they had, people had to be convinced of. And at this moment in Greek history that we're looking at here with the Phaedo, they're transitioning from a society that did not believe in souls to a society that did believe in souls. And Plato is instrumental in presenting the argument for the existence of, uh, a, of a soul. But before we get into Plato and what's going on with him, I just want to ask what a soul is to begin with. What, it is, what, what are we talking about? Um, and so ordinarily, so um, if this were a live class, I would have you write, uh, write some answers on the board. Um, I had online people give answers uh, as a part of an exercise. Uh, what I'm going to do in this video now is just talk about some common answers that people give. So one common answer has to do with um, moral functions. Well, actually, I'll just break them down into four categories. Um, there are moral functions for the idea of a soul. Um, there are basic mental functions, higher mental functions, and identity functions. Actually, let's start with the mental functions, because those tend to be what people mention first. Um, when people talk about some of their basic the basic aspects of their mental life, their internal life, your beliefs, desires, emotions, memories. Um, they often imagine that that is what is going on, that, that, that those things are happening in a soul that is separate from the body. Um, now, often, particularly in um, uh, older versions of Christianity, um, the notion of a soul is, uh, is also meant to separate us from animals. Animals are not thought to have a soul, um, according to basically older Christian traditions. These days, modern Christians often will assert that 
all dogs go to heaven and that sort of thing. But um, older Christian traditions tended to assert that uh, animals do not have a soul. So um, that means that the things that are uniquely human, that humans do with their minds that animals cannot, like use language or reason, are the uh, important mental functions of a soul. Um, people often, when I ask them what a soul is, talk about moral functions. So I'm back up at the top of the list. Um, your soul is a conscience. Um, so if you think you're doing something wrong and you're bothered by it, it is your soul that is um, telling you that, right? Also, um, it's important that a soul, uh, for many people, the soul is the thing that gets rewarded in the afterlife or punished, right? So in contemporary Christianity, um, the idea uh, that uh, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell is central for most accountings of it. Um, and that, and what is going to heaven or hell, what is receiving the punishment or the reward, is your soul. And that finally also means that uh, there, uh, uh, there needs to be identity functions for the soul, right? The soul is the real you. Um, uh, I mean, if it wasn't the real you, then why would you care whether uh, something in the afterlife is rewarded were punished. It's not actually you. So if you think about all these different things, oh, I guess another common answer that I'm not going to list here, people often will talk about what they think the soul is made of. Like, so they'll say it's a kind of an energy or it's an aura or it's a light. Um, and that's actually not where I was heading with this, although it could be any of those things. Um, I'm interested in what purpose it serves, right? What, 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 um, what we think it's doing for us. And then we can ask whether an aura or an energy or a light can do these things. Um, whether it, whether uh, an energy can be a source of mental functioning or can be your real identity. So there are all sorts of questions that come up in this context. Um, you know, why should I think I have one? Um, but also, why would one thing do all of these? Right? It's kind of interesting that all of these different functions got lumped together. Your real identity is also the thing that is the container for your memories. I mean, you, may, you may have not even um, thought to separate those, but what if the real you is not your memories, right? What if the real you is not your desires, your, your, um, your, your lusts and your feelings? Um, what if the real you isn't your ability to use reason, to talk, right? Um, so the... Uh, Right there, I'm just sort of prying away the identity function of the soul. The soul is the real you from uh, other things, other mental properties that the soul might do. All right. So I think this is a really good exercise for people. And I hope you spend some time um, really thinking about this for yourself. And that, that at this point, this is the that personal exercise is the main reason why I'm continuing with this in the course. Um, but let's turn now to Plato and what's going on with Plato. So this last dialogue that, we, that we're reading, um, the Phaedo, is what we call a middle period dialogue. Um, so Plato's early dialogues were all... Um, short stories about so short conversations involving Socrates where he asks about the meaning of an ethical term. Um, he isn't, and then he wa ends being unsatisfied with hi all the answers that are given, right? Um, 
these are thought to be written right after Socrates' death and to be a fairly accurate representation of what Socrates was up to. So, toward the middle of his career, Plato began to move away from just describing what Socrates did and start introducing his own ideas into the dialogues. And so now, instead of ending with a giant shrug, things end with a more positive answer, right? So Apology, which is an early dialogue, um, in Apology, uh, Socrates says, I don't know if there's an afterlife or not. Now, when we get to Phaedo, where, uh, which is a middle period dialogue, um, Socrates is definitely asserting there is absolutely an afterlife. You have an immortal soul, and that is the most important thing for you to care for. Right? Um, the, the middle period dialogues are often the ones that are thought, uh, thought to be most interesting to, um, to scholars. Late, the later dialogues get even more Dramat, uh, uh, dogmatic. They Socrates disappears altogether as a character sometimes, and they try to present a unified theory of everything. Um, and these dialogues are mostly just of interest to hardcore Plato fans, so we don't really deal with them. But I am giving you a little taste of middle period Plato, including Phaedo and Republic. So, like I said. Phaedo is arguing for the existence of a soul, and this is something that Plato's audience would have been skeptical of. Um, the idea of a soul was, was new. Um, uh, there was, uh, over in Egypt, there was an extensive discussion of soul and uh, of a real focus on the afterlife, but that had not come over to Greece. Um, and we'll talk about the possible role of the Pythagoreans in this in a second. Um, but first I want to talk about what was going on in Greece when, um, when people weren't thinking about a soul. And to do that, I'm going to look at Homer, right? Homer was a great poet, considered the focus of um, uh, Greek culture and religion. Um, and he wrote two long poems, he probably didn't actually exist, but there are two long poems extent, uh, attributed to him, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and they probably actually grew out of an oral tradition and may have been stitched together by a single individual or a small number of individuals to create the full story. But one of the things that happens in these stories is you, it, it's about the relationships between God and the, the gods and humans. Um, and there's a really interesting section that gives us a taste of the Homeric view of the afterlife. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about this briefly, and I'm going to show you the Marvel Comics version of the Odyssey because the visuals are nice. Right. So the, the story here is that our hero Odysseus needs to get uh, get some information. The only way he can get it is from uh, the seer Tiresias, but Tiresias is dead. So he has to go into the underworld to um, uh, meet the soul of Tiresias to get his information. Um, and so the underworld where everyone goes um, good or bad, is this dank place with lots of purples and grays. Um, and so this is Odysseus and his heroes coming in. The sorceress said we'd see a great rock where two roaring rivers run into each other. This then is the entrance to the dark abode of Hades. And once he gets into Hades, what, has, what he has to do is um, sacrifice two sheep. Um, and let their blood run into a trench. It's really quite gross. But what happens then is that all the souls of the dead show up uh, because they want to drink the blood of the sheep. But here's the deal with the souls in the afterlife. 
they actually cannot talk. So um, this all this stuff about the real you being your soul and your soul having, among other things, the power to think and speak and reason, that's not what's going on here. Um, for, uh, for Homer, the souls in the afterlife have no, t- no ability to speak unless they drink this blood, right? Um, and so, in fact, what they need to uh, speak isn't something incorporeal or ethereal or some energy. What they need to speak is something material, blood. And you can see here how Marvel, I forget the artists who were working on this, chose to represent um, the, the souls of the dead who cannot speak, right? They're approaching uh, Odysseus slowly. They're craving blood. They look like a horde of zombies. You see that even more in this next panel, right? Look at this. Back, you poor feckless ghosts. I will not let you near the blood till Tiresias has answered my questions, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, they, they look like zombies. So your soul isn't the most important part of you that gets rewarded in heaven. Your soul is like your zom- a zombie you that wanders around hell for a while. Um, and at one point... Um, uh, Achilles says that he would rather be a slave to a poor man um, than spend any time in the afterlife. There's no reward here. Well, the other interesting thing is that um, when Odysseus is in uh, Hades, was talking to the souls of the dead, he actually finds his mother. Um, and that is... Uh, that's a, that's a moment for him, right? He says, you were alive when I set out for Troy, and yet now you are dead. Um, okay. Uh, but he can't let her talk until he gets his prophecy from, oh, uh, from Tiresias, right? So Tiresias drinks the blood. Tiresias is a seer. Um, Tiresias has an important role in a lot of Greek literature, a lot of Greek plays, because he's a prophet, but he's blind. So at the beginning of most Greek plays, Tiresias set most Greek plays as a bit of an overstatement. But Tiresias says to the hero, even though I am blind, I can see that you're completely screwed. And that's the foreshadowing that, of, of all the tragedy to come. Um, so... Tiresias gets his blood and he can give his prophecy, which advances the plot. Um, but again, the point here is that all the things that we had been, been associating with soul on our earlier list, a real you, a thinking you, um, a you that is rewarded, it's not there. That's just not in this conception of the soul. So where is Plato getting this amazing idea that we have an immortal soul? Well, his immediate source is the Pythagoreans. I mentioned them before. Um, The Pythagoras was probably a real person, um, born around 580 BCE, and he probably traveled to Egypt. And that's where he learned math. And that's where he may have also become um, ex- exposed to the idea of soul and afterlife, which was obviously a bigger deal in Egypt, right? Um, so the Pythagoreans believed that the whole world was made out of number. The numbers were gods, especially the number 10. They formed a cult in Sicily, but they were run out of town, and the refugees wind up in Athens and Two of them are in Plato's school, and they are major characters in this dialogue, the Phaedo. So, um, the Pythagoreans believed in souls. They also believed in reincarnation. And they believed that progressive reincarnations led to enlightenment. Um, But enlightenment requires purifying the soul. 
So the care and nurturing of your soul becomes something incredibly important. Your soul is no longer some zombie shade ghost of you in hell craving blood. Your soul is now the real you that you need to cultivate. Interestingly, the soul for the Pythagoreans wasn't an entity. They didn't talk about energies or mists or light. It was a harmony or a ratio. It was pure idea. It was a form. Um, and I so uh, I mentioned Plato's theories of the forms before when we were talking about the cave, the other middle period dialogue that we read a snippet of. I want to emphasize this again. So Plato had two important theories. Um, the theory of the forms and the doctrine of recollection. Um, so one of the things I, I talked about in the Plato, in the cave um, video was the idea of uh, a priori knowledge, knowledge that was gained prior to experience. And in fact, if you didn't have this prior knowledge, you wouldn't be able to experience things to begin with. The whole world would just be a, a huge confusion if you didn't have prior knowledge with which to sort it. Um, and in modern psychology, this kind of prior knowledge is often thought of as innate learning modules. That's the phrase psychologists will use. But Plato doesn't talk about innate learning modules. Plato just talks about the prior existence of the soul. So your soul existed before you were born. And when it existed, it was in contact with the real things, the ideas, and it knew everything. So the doctrine of recollection, it's an epistemological doctrine. It's about the origin of knowledge. And it says that all knowledge is recollection of what you knew before you were born. It doesn't come from the senses. It comes from the things you experience triggering your memory of life in the real world. And the real world is the theory of the forms, is the, is the world of the forms. And like I said, uh, the theory of the forms is a metaphysical doctrine. It's about what is. And the claim is that what really is, isn't the sensory items in front of you, but the ideas of things. Um, the ideas are eternal um, and unchanging. Whereas the things in front of you, they, they change, they fall apart. So, like I said, um, the, Plato's basic idea is that the definitions Socrates sought exist on their own, and they are called the forms. They are more real than anything else, but they have no sensory qualities. They just exist as pure ideas, and you have to reach out with them with the thing that knows in you, which is your immortal soul. Um, and uh, sensible things exist because they participate in the forms. The forms are like the sun in the analogy of the, of the cave. The sun both shines light on things so that we can see them and gives them energy so that they exist. Um, and the forms unify particular things. So we talked about uh, chairs, right? All sorts of different kinds of chairs. What, what do they all have in common um, that lets us recognize them as chairs? Well, it's the idea, pure idea of chair. All right. Um, so that's the Phaedo. Um, what... The part of it that you read was the death scene. So the idea here is that Socrates um, is, having argued that there is an immortal soul, embraces death. He, in fact, take, drinks the hemlock before he needs to because he uh, knows he is going to a better place. All right, so that wraps up the Plato section. Um, the last, well, um, the next video will explain other assignments.